Welcome to Outdoor Spotlight, an interview and insight program brought to you by Northwest Sportsman Magazine and www.nwsportsmanmag.com. Now let's check in for all things for the Northwest Sportsman. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Jim Clark once again with another segment of uh, Outdoor Spotlight here at Northwest Sportsman. Uh, today we are honored to have Michael Schroeder from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, Michael received his Bachelor of Science degree from Texas A&M, Master of Science degree with the University Research for Spruce Grouse, and a Doctor of Philosophy uh, from Colorado State University. Uh, great research on prairie chickens and uh, a wildlife bi biologist who pursued research and management of grouse since 1981. He joined the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife in 1992 and has continued to focus most of his activities on the biology and management of grouse. Welcome, Michael. How are you? Uh, very good. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Anything that you would like to add to our introduction? No, I think you just about covered the most important stuff. Okay, so let's get right into it. So we're talking today really about small game, and specifically when we look at this uh, species of forest grouse in Washington, why is this important to us? First of all, we have four species of forest grouse, and uh, you know, with the rough grouse, spruce grouse, city, and dusky grouse, and it's, it's interesting to kind of get a, a lay of the land with those species because the situation's changed a bit over the years. Sooty and dusky grouse were originally uh, named those species, but then they were combined as a blue grouse. And so hunters a lot of times get confused about what we're talking about. So I wanted to clear that a little bit first. Okay. When it comes to grouse, what makes them so fascinating for people who live in Washington and to a certain degree, everyone who lives in this country is there's a long history of interest in grouse. It goes back to the way the Native Americans used to use them as a as an important food source. Uh, even Lewis and Clark were uh, hunting grouse in the state of Washington, mm -hmm. but they were an important uh, source of food for them and also very interesting species for them to pay attention to. So we have a long history, uh, a long tradition. They're an important part of our hunting culture, uh, as well as an important part of our bird watching culture. They're just really fundamental to the way of life in the West. So how does uh, the WDFW manage forest grouse specifically? So what, what we do in Washington is we focus on three general areas, the season length, uh, bag limits or possession limits, and methods of take to kind of focus on something that, that people can understand uh, really simply. Bag limit is, is an example of that. Uh, for many years, the bag limit for forest grouse, and that's all those species lumped together, was three birds. And that meant that you could go out and you could harvest three birds in a day. Uh, it was, the bag limit was three birds for many years. Mm -hmm. And what happened several years ago is that the bag limit was changed from three to four after, like I said, many years of, of thought. That four bird bag limit was changed a few years ago so that it wouldn't just be a straight four bird bag limit, but it, it, it could be three birds of any of the four grouse species with the exception that the blue grouse were, were lumped sooty and dusky grouse. And the uh, fourth species or the fourth bird that you shot would have to be a different species. So it was a, a modified four bird bag limit. So and that just gives you an example of how, how one attribute of the forest grouse season could be changed. And then that in terms of management, then the, uh, as I understand it, why did the forest grout season dates change then? So uh, like the second thing I mentioned, of course, was the season length. Now season length uh, tends to be a little bit trickier and, and, and hunters will know this because almost every species they hunt has a different uh, season start and often se season endings. And the grouse are probably one of the few groups of species where we've been relatively consistent. The season has started on September 1 since 1973, hmm. which is pretty unusual. And uh, so of all the species we harvest, whether it's fish or uh, wildlife, 
there's hardly a group of species that has a simpler season than grouse. So the question would be after all that time, it's been you know almost uh, 50 years, why change the season start now? Well, the, there's a lot of research that has gone into this and uh, whether it's uh, checking hunters at check stations, uh, collecting wings at wing barrels, questionnaires to hunters, doing transects or actually going out and doing breeding bird surveys. There's, uh, when you take a look at all this data, there's some pretty good indications that populations have declined on some of these key species. And not only that, the, uh, the behavioral work that's been done on grouse has shown that brood breakup for the forest grouse usually happens in the middle of September or sometime around that period, meaning that the females are with chicks until the middle of September. And because of that, these females, especially these brood hens, are particularly susceptible. And to, to be honest with you, there's been interest in changing the season for many years. Okay. It's just that it's hard to do when it's such an important part of the tradition. And when you're talking a 50-year-old tradition, the longer it goes, the harder it is to change. But, you know, the data, the data supports it. And in fact, the data has supported it for quite a few years. It's just that we finally got the uh, willpower to, to make a change that, and frankly, is overdue. You know, it's interesting because at Labor Day weekend, there's a lot of states here on the West Coast, specifically that uh, the traditional dove opener has always been around that Labor Day time period as well. And so your research kind of backs up, you know, why the forest grouse with the breakup of the brood there is important to kind of recognize that. So obviously based on research, which is a good thing. And uh, how do the regulations here in Washington on forest grouse compare to other upland birds? So you can kind of get a sense of how different this is and, and maybe kind of question why we were treating grouse so specially because a lot of the, uh, the other species, like you mentioned, chucker, gray partridge, uh, California quail, ring-necked pheasant, if you look at eastern Washington, for example, all of those seasons start in October and end in January. And one of the reasons is we don't want to harvest these birds when they're still together with broods, basically. We want to give them a chance to get through that breeding season, have a chance to disperse in the, in the habitat, and in the long term, provide better opportunity for hunters. I know it sounds counterintuitive, for, especially for hunters who have this deep-seated uh, tradition of going out on Labor Day, that they would lose the Labor Day grouse season, but there's something that's not fair play in a sense for harvesting birds that are still in intact broods, especially when in some cases they're really too young to, to be able to escape or even make a reasonable uh, chase out of it. Uh, so they don't, they don't really fit the idea of fair chase at that stage. And I think that if most hunters could see the type of data we've been able to see over the years, they would, they would support this. It's, if you look at the data, we've got thousands and thousands of birds that have been examined at check stations and with the aid of wing barrels. And the vast majority of the birds that are harvested are chicks. So that's not too surprising. That's the same with, mm. uh, with most wildlife species. Wow. But the, uh, what makes it more amazing with the grouse situation is that if you look at just the breeding age birds, the, that other third of the birds that are harvested, the majority of them, roughly 60% in a good chunk of Washington, are females. That would be 60% female, 40% male. And among those 60% female, most of those are successful brood hens. So we're se selectively harvesting not only females, but females who were successful at raising chicks. And that's not a very good way to manage for population increases or to even manage for population stability. It's pretty clear that if you, if you manage a species like that for too long, you're gonna lose, you're gonna have lower populations in some of the key areas that hunters like to go. And whether they see it or not, it's probably affected uh, hunting opportunities in some of the areas that people love the most. And so just for clarity, what are, are the dates have been changed? What are those dates and what is the length of the season now based on the research we've been talking about? 
So the season actually has increased a day in length. Uh, that may not seem like much because it's now 122 days long instead of 121 days long. So it starts the 16th of September and ends the 16th of January. And uh, that's pretty comparable to some of the other seasons. It still starts earlier than the, uh, than the pheasant, quail, and partridge seasons in the mm -hmm. east side of the state. But I know the part that hurts the most about this is because I, I personally have talked to and know of, uh, hunters who really love that Labor Day, right. yeah. Labor Day period. And that's the part that that really makes me feel the worst about it. And we, as an agency, we're trying to figure out how we could take care of these uh, this this bird situation, which is clearly not very good in the long term, and at the same time, uh, not take away too much opportunity for the hunters who really love that situation. Certainly. And frankly, it was just a tough. It was a tough call. That's gotcha. Um. So in terms of location and where people uh, would be able to go with a new season in place, where would you recommend people start looking? Wow. So that's a loaded question. It's uh, we're actually quite lucky in the state of Washington, and I can guarantee you there are a lot of people, uh, hunters in other states who would love to have the opportunity we have in Washington. We've got 39 counties in the state. And out of those 39 counties, we've got uh, at least one of these species of forest grouse in 35 of those counties. And uh, not only that, but the vast majority of these grouse are found in public lands. And when you're reading my uh, biography, you mentioned I went to school at Texas A&M. And, and I can tell you, if you want to hunt in Texas, you better have a pretty uh, big stash of cash in your wallet because it's going to cost a lot of money when you have to pay for leases or opportunities to hunt on private land. We're really lucky in the state of Washington. Uh, if you're a hunter, you've got 122 day long season to hunt four species of grouse, 35 counties, most of which is public land where these birds are found. You're not going to have many opportunities that are that rich. That's great, but that is interesting. And I can see, you know, that hunters out there need to recognize, you know, what the research backs up. And you mentioned the research. I just want to ask you if someone really wanted to delve into that, how would they uh, look at that and where would they find it? As an agency, we put out pretty uh, regular reports dealing with this, and those are publicly uh, available. We also do reports to the commission on a periodic basis, and those are, uh, uh, those are opportunities for the public to address them as well. And there's actually a, well, I wouldn't say it's simple, but it's, we do have a season setting process that's basically six years for a game management plan and every three years to set seasons. So we set seasons for three years at a time, roughly with opportunities to modify those seasons on an annual okay. basis. And there are opportunities for the public to get involved in the process at every stage of that. Uh, none of the data that we collect is, is secret. Um, we, matter of fact, we really depend on the hunters to provide data. What we want to do, though, is to make sure that the hunters realize that this is really a two-way street, that we're not doing this because we're trying to take away opportunities. We're looking at this as a way to improve grouse populations so that hunters actually have more opportunities in the long term. It may seem a little painful at first when you lose an important Labor Day opportunity, but in the grand scheme of things, we're hoping that uh, a little more protection for these uh, these brood hens will uh, produce more chicks in the long term, and more chicks will equate to greater opportunity. I, I understand what you're saying, Michael. And you know, it it is. You mentioned it's a two way street. I think it's important for all fishermen and hunters to recognize that they have a voice, and um, I sometimes think that. You know, they don't believe that, but I think if they got more involved, um, you know, looking at your website, looking at the Northwest Sportsman website, certainly Andy Walgamont, our editor, is involved in a lot of uh, inter interaction with hunters and fishermen out there. And it's important that the public recognize that they do have input, and but they just need to voice it. And, you know, how would, again, how would someone do that in terms of getting in touch with the WDFW? So if you go to the WDFW website, they actually have 
not only ways in which you can get involved with just commenting on some of the proposed seasons, because every three years when we do the season setting process, we come up with a list of options and then those go out for public review. So they ha certainly have that opportunity, but the, I think there's a way as well on the online that they can submit their names so they can get regular uh, mailings for when something is available to comment on or when there's an opportunity for them to get involved. We actually do really listen to this stuff, uh, the, uh, the comments that, that citizens have. And in some, some ways, that's what makes it such a challenge because sometimes when you're looking at some data and you can say, well, it's pretty clear we have to take this path, but it's really hard sometimes when you know you're going to have opposition to it. But it's, you know, it really does help in the long term to have the involvement because you have to know how, how people think about this stuff. And, and frankly, we learn a lot by talking to these users, uh, not only finding out like what it is that's working right, what it is that's working wrong. My conversations with hunters in the field, sometimes it's been situations where you talk to somebody and they say, explain to you why they don't hunt forest grouse anymore. And the reality is the number of people who are hunting forest grouse has declined substantially over the years. And it's hard to understand why when you think of, of what, you know, for $40 and, and 50 cents or whatever the current in-state license fee is for a, uh, if you just wanted to hunt upland game, that's an incredible amount of opportunity for a pretty low cost. And like I said, there are a lot of other states who would love to have what we have here in Washington. And to under, it's nice to at least get a sense of why hunters may, may think they're not getting a fair shake and opportunity to exchange viewpoints. So how hard is it to get into uh, hunting the forest grouse? Is it a difficult hunt? Is it a lot of trouncing around? Are they using dogs? I mean, what, what is it that, that would attract a hunter to doing this? So it can be very complicated depending on what you do, because some people, the, the whole dog routine can be extremely elaborate, well-trained dogs that are extremely good in the field. But the reality is you don't need all that. Uh, hunting grouse can be very simple and an adventure. You can explore some of the unbeaten paths throughout Washington, get out in the open country. Uh, I recommend getting off the roads. Uh, a lot of people do like to, to use roads as a way of getting access to forest grouse, but sometimes the opportunities are better when you get off the roads and get out into to some of this unexplored country. Um, what's nice about forest grouse is you don't need a dog. You, all you have to do is get out there, get into the open. You have 120 days, 22 days to do it. And you're going to see some great country, whether you find grouse or not. And if you do find grouse, what's interesting about the grouse in, in Washington, if you come across them, your chances of getting a harvested bird are actually pretty good. Great. So it's a great way to get out. Cool. Lot of I like it. Uh, Michael, thank you very, very much. Again, Michael Schroeder uh, with the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we want to thank you for joining us today on uh, Outdoor Spotlight, and uh, we hope to talk to you again real soon. Thank you. It was great. I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you very much.